We're back for another week of Teach Tapes, and we just went through a few weeks of a scenario built around the framework of a talk by Brandon Staley. And, and what we're going to do starting today is walk you down the field and through different situations and areas on the field, and we're going to think about the thought process for each of these areas. How do you approach these situations, and what are the techniques, especially, that are showcased in these moments? So... As we look at this, the, the game is on. you got to think through these situations. And, of course, joining us, as he does every week, to go into the details of it, a guy who studies all these things, the insides and outs of technique and all the situations they apply in, Steve Hauser. Steve, great to have you back again this week. Thanks, Keith. You know, like you said, it was really nice the last few weeks to have that structure of the Brendan Staley conversation. But I was thinking of – just how do we keep that framework and make sure we have something that we're progressing on? And at least it's a tight encapsulated moment. You see the college game day stuff with McAfee and it's incredible, but even the basketball, I think it was Jay Billis that would walk the floor with some of these guys, right? Taking the ball out all the way to the finish. And you have that brief conversation. Well, how do we as a group of people trying to learn and figure this out, just move down the field. So starting backed up, what does that imply, right? There's obviously a kick return at some point. Maybe there was a punt return. Now the offense is in a situation. What are they seeing from the defense? What's their philosophy to move? And what is success, right? Obviously, we can get into the open field and then building into the, the score zone and goal on at the end of the day. But just kind of giving us a framework that hopefully these techniques fit within. As I progress through my career, you, you start to work on different formats for practice and thinking about things. And what I really liked about our second last day before the game, so in, in, at the college level, a Thursday, if this is at the high school level, it's a Wednesday, is really starting to put the game together in context for your players because you work it in certain contexts throughout the week. But for instance, you know, you're going to work all your third downs and you move the ball around, you'll have the chains out and simulate all those things. But Thursdays for us were always about simulated drives starting in different areas of the field with different objectives, working in special teams at times as they apply to those situations. And I think that's very important when you look at the framework of this because the game is always played in context. There's always time on the clock. There's always a down and, and distance to go. There's always a hash mark that the ball is on on the field. So you have to account for all of those things. And the, the more you can put your players in those situations in practice and get them to understand things, the better they're going to get on game day, especially as they go through a season. It's interesting you bring that up, Keith. The first thing that just came to mind was a Josh McDaniels line from, I think it was an NFL Films thing on, on the Super Bowl against the Rams. And you know, what do guys want to run on the goal line in the biggest moment is something they're comfortable with. It's something they've repped a bunch. It's not something sexy and crazy that we drew up that we're really excited about. It's what do they have reps invested in? Who should have the ball in their hands in those biggest moments? So if you're talking about going into the pressure cooker of being backed up, well, everybody on that field should know these are the three or four things that we rep. These are what we're really good at. And obviously going on two is a huge advantage for the offense and making sure you have some ways, man, do we need to just have this quarterback sneak? Do we have our base runs? Are we going to have a movement pass? Or the philosophy of Oklahoma State was more yards for us to gain. We're going to max protect, give a play action, and make sure we got our best playmakers matched up one-on-one, -on -one, and let's go. Maybe it's the offsides. Maybe it's the PI down the field. We're giving ourselves a couple different ways to succeed and, and get the ball away from where all these other people are. So just, again, being confident in knowing what your plan is. Yeah, definitely. And and there's things that your players should start to get to know before we got going. I shared with you that on, on a Thursday, maybe after we did it once or twice, the expectation of our guys was, guys, you know what we're doing here. And so we would get to that period, usually it was for us, the, the first team period on a Thursday, we're putting the ball on the minus one. And our play always that we wanted to start with is a play action shot isolated guy protected something to the outside double move whatever on two and so inevitably the the, the quarterback who was coming get back would get it because i've already done this to him but the new guys if i had a new guy you know we get to that period and i tell you know our coaches our signalers only don't don't send anything in let's see what he does let's see what he knows let's see what these guys do 
and you know the first time they're always standing there and you know so there's the uh a little bit of the scripted you know being agitated that you know all right they're going to do it wrong i'm going to jump their asses and and then they're never going to do that again and it's going to put a focus on what we do and you know it's those things are important though you do want your players to understand those guys you're not just out here all the time and i call the play and go do it you have to understand what's the framework what's the context of this and as you said in this situation that we're looking to at today it's really the pressure cooker and it's even optics too right Keith I mean you're saying and I know they moved it down to the 20 after COVID to have some space on the sideline but you're at the edge of that box and you're at the 25 and you're looking all the way down to the goal line there's some physical separation so you got to feel like man it's really us moving forward as a unit and the way we define that success was you just got to get a first down even if we don't get a first down, we can't be in this minus one to minus four world because now we're putting a situation on the punt team and now they have to have their own limiting factors of what their success is to make sure we give our defense a chance. So if the offense, even if we don't get that first down, man, we've got to be outside that four yard line so we can operate a normal punt and have general expectations for having a base set up with our alignments, assignments, get a great ball directionally and go cover. Because when you tighten those splits, when you have to get in a specialized format and one-step punt that thing, you can only ask those guys to have so much success too. So it is playing complementary football in other ways besides just running and playing good defense. Well, we'll start with a little bit of a case study today from this past weekend, an incredible college football game. I don't care what side you were rooting for, if you were at all. It's a game that there's just a ton of takeaways from, and that's Alabama, Tennessee. And so we start off with a a kickoff that puts Alabama on the seven, their own seven. Uh, There's a holding call right away, minus four. Then there's a false start to the two. Then there's a bad snap, right? So there's all these things happening. They're certainly under pressure here. And that's what I'll turn it over to you here and discuss some of the things. And as we said, the things you want to think about, the situations that you're in and the techniques that get showcased here. Well, and I think to start, Keith, you go right back to our episode the other week of talking about penalties and what you can control. When you have a holding penalty, we talked about a violation of feet. We're, we're restricting movement, and it's, it's something outside of our framework, right? So is it our angle? Is it you know, our, our hands? And, and then adjusting and knowing when to play legal and go next level. You know, One of these instances was a block in the back on Bama on KOR, I mean, you should be never turning and running backwards on KOR because nothing but bad things going to happen. Now, from the offensive standpoint, they're inside, they're starting field position. They get a holding call on, on P and 10, and now they're backed up. Now it's P and 17, and then there's a false start. And now we're at the two, and now you're going into empty, right? You got Bill O'Brien and, and Bryce Young who are, hey, they're going into that Tom Brady world of, man, you're in control of the protections. We got some cadence tools of, are we double clapping? Are we simulating the clap? Are we going off the knee? Even after the bad snap, the center went from a no look to a look snap. I mean, and you're, you got all at Neyland Stadium having the best time of their life in the first quarter. And you're operating, you know, in empty, right? So it's, it's again, how do you use your space and, and make sure you can operate but just having that plan, you, you better be really comfortable because it, it can happen really fast. And it happened in the first quarter, the second drive of the game for Bama. So when you look at this area of the field being backed up, communication is critical. Not that it isn't in other parts of the field, but uh, a mistake here uh, can be catastrophic for the offense. And at the same time, you know, a big momentum swing if the offense is able to do something here that, now the defense miscommunicates, and there's a big play. So thoughts on those kinds of things and miscommunication and things you can do to force extra communication. Yeah, it, it's fun to watch, Keith, because in, in this area, it's much more of a, a one-play mentality, right? Like special teams, it's, it's you know, people say one shot, one kill. Well, you only get one down. In the backed-up world, it's a lot like third down and long when you're seeing, man, I really got to show up because – you know it's going to be more exotic. There's going to be, you know, more room for error, so to speak. So you're getting things on the offensive side of showing one and, and shifting to another. So we had quad into the boundaries from Duke. Then they get into a two tight end set and they're in bounds. Bama's going and motioning a tight end from one side across three different people having different bump off and man exchanges. Well, then they're just ripping it out there and now spit out 
and he's going to blast that corner. It's not complicated on the offensive end, but the other side, they're building that yo tight end, and he's motioning into a bunch that was already a wide receiver stack. Right? I heard from people who've been around Saban, that's one of the huge things that he talks about for his receivers and his DB coaches. Like, what are you going to do from bunches, from stacks? How tight is that cluster to the, the, the line of scrimmage, to the box, I should say? Again, there's so many things that can have minor communication. And from that stack to a bunch, they just had the tight end run a four-step speed out, and they outflanked the defense. Well, again, it's just that little spy versus spy stuff. That, that can make those situations even more impactful for both sides. When I look at this area, especially in the run game, right, thinking of this from the offensive side and thinking about what the defense is going to do, I you know one thing we always looked at is how could we make those edges longer? And, you know, I, I've even seen teams who are 10 personnel take that into consideration and bring somebody back and, and have that guy, you know, I saw it was the first time I saw this, I think it was Mountain Union was doing it with a – a little receiver and he would just get to that edge to that tackle and he kind of looked like that wing on a, a field goal right who's just elongating that edge making sure that somebody can't come skinning right down the line and make that tackle for loss in the backfield you have to be aware of those situations and so it's the setup of the play right thinking about your, your personnel your formation maybe emotion that comes across etc but it's also coaching up the backs on the offensive side that you get guys, you can't dance around on the field. We really have to have a sense of urgency of getting the ball up into the line of scrimmage. And then on the defensive side, it's, you know, setting yourself up to be able to chase down the line and make those plays in the backfield and potentially even cause a fumble. And what's awesome, Keith, is it comes down to base fundamentals and base football. You can have as many guys on that backside edge lengthening it out. Like, I've talked to guys in the special teams world, like, they just call it a ghost alignment. Yeah, we're bringing in the backside end. He's not blocking anybody. He's just widening the edge, and he's still free releasing. So you can have that, that silly mismatch of the 175-pound slot receiver in that backside bunch all tightened down. All he's doing is running across the far V and, and getting a butt block in there, and the play's not going near him. So just getting the back going north-south, there's some really good – not to – you know, be cliche, but these Big Ten, I'm looking at Illinois, Indiana, guys getting downhill and, and even Michigan State of like under center in a true midline pass blasting that thing north-south. Now, to get into the drills and the teach tapes component, there's two good teach RB reps. One, again, a, a common name that I throw around is Eddie Faulkner with, with the uh, Steelers. He's had his other running backs just be in a flow. Like it looks like uh, trees swaying in the breeze and that's the running back pass. They move, they give a gap. Obviously, they're running through the butt crack of the center and, and starting that pass either front side or back side. But the other thing is just heavy backs. You can see the tracks. The Colts will have their running back coach and the assistant navigating that. So just giving those guys an immediate pass. But also, thinking about first level first for these guys, you had Arkansas versus BYU. They're at the minus one. And that front side single block, however you want to say it in your terms, they're driving that guy in high knee and gallop and, you know, some great drills from Ticho line to go through that. And they're bringing that guy four or five yards before they ever come off to the second level linebacker. It's amazing. That's a mentality. So you got to have your base runs, whether you're elongating that edge. The other side is just the back alignment. The PFF stuff is amazing now of what you can do and know just where those guys are aligned and what kind of situation you can get, whether it's a pistol you're jumping that guy late. Another thing I saw was Wisconsin. It's that elongated edge. It's not just the backside of a zone concept. Well, it's the front side of power, right? right? Let's get that thing down. And then everybody logs and it's power O and we're keeping it through the outside edge. And now we've got a counter and they're doing it from the same side. Key. So it looks like it's going to be inside zone, which is everybody's jamming out the, the gut there. But now they've got a counter off of it as well. So it's really good football because then you got your movement passes. You see some true sprint protection from Stanford, sprint with the speed out, you know, your naked boot game, and not just the comeback and the, and the get in vision, but a little bit of a sail concept with the front side flood. You can get some good things to get guys out in space and, and have some compliments. I'll tell you, mentioning those Eddie Faulkner drills, I mean, he's been doing those forever. I can remember, you know, being at, at Ball State. 
at their clinic and when he was the running backs coach there they were they were doing those drills back then right so good drills i think stand the test of time there's no doubt about it and so part of that too of of trusting your pass and and making sure we can go because there's going to be some variation in the defensive line too like they get to play and they get to coach as well so you're seeing some different te opportunities where the end is now folding back under you know they get that front side guard trying to go second level and now he's knife in the play you got two reps of that from notre dame this week against stanford again there's some te uh, i should say tn and nt stunts right wisconsin and duke just these interior games where that pass better be true and less is more because again sometimes you're taking that tag off of it that you'd have in the open field so you only have so many options because you don't want to be thinking through things with your back against the wall. So just making sure you can get downhill and really fall forward and, and again, get yourself out of a negative situation. Looking at this area, while it seems intuitive to run the football, you want to play it safe. There is a lot of opportunity here in the past game. And from both sides of the ball, there needs to be a focus on how you're going to handle these situations from a schematic perspective, but also with the technique that you play. Before you can do anything, right, the O-line guy is always saying, how can I protect it? How do we make sure this thing can get out? Well, we talked about the, the backed up shots coming from those singled up outside receivers. Well, you can also do that with Coach Gundy would always call it the Baylor theory. You have your stop, go post from that inside receiver. But again, it's still a max pro turn protection. You got seven guys in there and you're really just isolating that safety and making sure we can play fast. There's a great example of that against Tennessee and Bama. One of the other things, I think it was an excellent rep from USC. They got Jordan Addison and Caleb Williams out of the transfer portal and they've got him tucked into Jordan Addison, the, the Belitnikoff winner, tucked in as a wing to the boundary and they're running vert shadow and they've got him on a chip release helping out that that boundary end so now he's delayed and all it's doing is giving him space and time while all these guys clear it out and now he's got big grass to the field and he get a 14 20 yard gain there so again it's it's players formations plays it's it's making sure you got quick easy decisions and part of that stuff too is making sure you can get out fast. Notre Dame and other players, that tight end, they basically got an NFL starting tight end on, on the Notre Dame roster right now. And just the three-point stance, just jabbing and uncovering, a um, little bit of a lift, a lift and snapping it off on the under. It was a front side flood concept, but there's a great, you know, even today, I think I put it out, was the Browns repping that versus a wide nine and then leaning and lifting with that arm bar, kind of how we talked about, yeah, there's there's offensive PI, but if you're doing it from that lower body and you're not extending your hand, you can get away with it at the top of the route. Again, just guys having some awareness, even if it's not technically that outside receiver, how do you narrow up those matchups inside and in the line, but also rep it, a chip concept. You don't need to be this big hulking guy. I forget, I think it was the, the Rams game the other day. They ran a full turn protection and, and they had that slot receiver. It was, la- it was uh, last night in the Chargers game. They had a guy going against someone 100 pounds different than him. But again, the full turn protection, they're able to take a deep shot and you can do some things out of different personnel and give your guys a chance. Flipping it over to the other side and looking at the pass game, you know, this is going back all the way to, I think we called it mayhem moments, right? In week one, the, the tips and overthrows, uh, matching the hand, all those things that really now, as you said, These techniques really become showcase because that tip ball down here with very little space in front of you to go, I mean, that that can end up being six points for the defense. It's gold. And these guys, you start to see this. That's why the the max protection piece and the movement pass is so important of just getting these guys off off kilter a little bit. Because, again, that tip ball, that that prize, that that bonus gets up so high with now the turnover started field position. There's so many good things guys are doing with different volleyballs. So you're not you're not bashing fingertips, even movement pass. You know guys are coming back and working back over to that front side player and reacting and showing pursuit. So again, it is something that even more emphasis in this area of the field because of the the bang for your buck. So that takes us to fourth down as we walk through this area and for the offensive side, it's getting out of this, right? They, 
They obviously wanted to get a first down. You want to get room for the punt, obviously looking at all these things in these situations to, to get as many yards forward as you can. But we talked about this before this season, things like the butt punt come into play here. Yeah, and, and there's a great explanation of you know Pat McAfee getting on the Manning cast as, as that was a little bit more topical a few weeks ago. You can never be going backwards in that situation from the personal protector. Obviously, the punter's got to be executing a one-foot punt. Right-foot punter's got his right foot up. Jab, plant, get that thing off. Um, you know, there's part of that situation, too, is you know guys being properly aligned. You know, hand up. I, I talked about our punter not being aligned the right way in the end zone it being a big open open space out there and making sure your proportions are right. Now, just from a directional standpoint with the punter, you know, as much as anything, you, you saw a block from, from Liberty earlier in the year against Purdue, but also a big thing is these max protection reps. I mean, OU, when they had C.D. Lamb, it was one of the scariest things going because you got this guy who's a freak with the ball in his hands, and you also have everybody max, max holding up, and you're in a, uh, you have to be in a protection mindset to get the ball in the air. So you got to make sure direction is a premium. I took it from another coach that called it home run punt. Man, we're trying to punt this thing out of bounds and put a barrel at the 40 or the 45 yard mark from where the ball is. Because just from an expectation standpoint, it's not the punter's fault. It's not the punt team's fault that the ball is in that position, right? They have to go execute the play that they're given. And the idea behind that from a team philosophy is make the opposing offense earn it. Make them get one first down to put their field goal kicker in a max field goal situation. That way you give your defense a fighting chance. So I think that's important when you talk about, because you got to get in an alignment, not only to protect the launch point and know where that is, just like you would in the past game, but you've got to make sure it's aligned, not just for the protection, but we actually have to go cover this thing. Because that's as scary as anything sometimes. Looking at this coach, the, the techniques become very important here. We look at the gunners. We need those guys to have a clean release, to be able to get down the field with speed, etc. But again, as I said before, we're putting this drill, we're putting what's happening here within the context of the game, on the field, what's going on here, backed up. So some of the considerations that you have in these areas in practicing and teaching the technique. Before you can even get to the technique, Keith, some people, I mean, you got to be creative with your personnel and walk that shield up. Take the air out of the drill. And there's no reason to have three shields if you can have another guy off the line of scrimmage and create that width, that elongated edge, that ghost alignment. If you can get a front side gunner who wins, that shuts the play down. It's the same as a quarterback and a receiver of a 40 yard go ball. Like we got to trust that I'm putting the ball in a spot. You know, it's going to be on the bottom of the numbers of the red line. And you got to get to that spot in 4.4 seconds. Well, in order to do that, the number one thing a gunner needs is speed, right? And it's NASCAR. You got to be able to play thin and fast through that, that jammer, right? Make sure, you know, if you get collisioned and go out into the sideline, man, he can't touch you. So that outside release has to be a premium because if you go inside and get washed, what are we doing? Right. We got nobody home now and really focusing on reducing surface stacking, getting front to back. You can have the hoop drills. You can have the pencil arms. Also, you're going to have to be able to long stride sometimes and go through a dropper, a guy who's MDM on the returner. Sometimes you'll get that ladder player coming out of the box, having some awareness because that's all this guy is doing is beating that jammer and working through these mismatches. There was a rep earlier this year, Bama's punting backed up, and they got Texas Banks, is, you know, know what they're going to do, the philosophy of the, the head ball coach there. He's got a vice when they're punting to the field. It's a true lashed vice. Man, you got to have some awareness. You got to square your feet. You got to rip and run and, and know that I got to use the sideline to my advantage there and how it relates, and can I counter is, do I get a crossover from that, that front side player? Can I get back through that boundary um, and get vertical? So having a little bit of awareness, especially in backed up, you're going to get a max hold up situation. Is it a hard vice? Is it building one from the box? Is there an MDM returner back there? Because we've got to give you those guys some help as they get out of that contested area at the line of scrimmage. Now on the other side of it, the return team or the, the pump block team, they have an opportunity here as well. And that opportunity ranges from great field position for your offense to potentially a score. 
Uh, again, things are a little bit different down here. The angles change, especially if it's a short punt. So some of the technique and drills that you're thinking about here and even some of the schematic things. As much as anything, Keith, it's, it's angles and knowing that you're going to get a different formation. So you've got to have a little bit of awareness. You know, Iowa, they, they're always and forever going to have those guys very tight, plugged up in the A-gap, and everybody's holding the man inside of their thigh, and they're punching out. Well, that's a different hold-up scheme than the rest of your game. There's a reason they get into that 1982 punt formation. Well, the head man's not going to get one block. Well, you better have a certain thought of you're going to long stride those guys and run through just like the NFL punt teams, punt return teams do. There's a lot of space to the field, right, because everybody's trying to have that directional aspect. Well, if you lock those guys down in a tight space to the field, that's a lot of daylight, and there's only a snapper out there. Because usually you'd love to have two guys detached or even a free releaser from that backside end. You're not going to have that with the contested block point with it being a short, short angle backside. So really, again, stress and puncture and get vertical. Or you can run that with, uh, I think it was Houston versus Texas Tech, got a big one this year off of that bad kick direction and then outflank those wide guys to the field. So that, that field becomes even more dangerous in that adjusted alignment. All right, the last thing to think about here is the rare situation. There are things that from time to time do come up. And two in particular here. I want to talk about getting out of the half. Could even be the end of the game here. When you have to punt out of your own end zone, but there's only a few ticks on the clock and how we handle that. And then I want to talk about the free kick. So let's talk first about the situation where Only a few ticks left on the clock. You prefer not to put that ball off your foot if you don't have to. How do you handle that? Two things. One, you can walk off the back of the end zone and win the Super Bowl like the Ravens did against the 49ers. So you got, you're up five. You still tie the game in overtime. If they do hit a field goal, and we think that the Ravens even walked it out to win the Super Bowl, it was really close at the end. You know, the other thing is, the Patriots, there's a rep against the Broncos a long, long time ago. They actually took a fast safety. So they were down, I think it was three points or something, and they just ripped the ball through the back of the end zone, and then they hit an onside kick from the minus 20 to try to get the ball back rather than putting themselves out with no chance and giving the opponent the ball in the positive field position. So those are two historical things at the end of a game of – take a slow safety or take a fast safety and go for the onside kick. Now, the thing that happened this week, USC trying to get out of the half against Utah, they're going, it's fourth and extra long. There's four seconds, right? This was something we practiced. You talk about Thursday reps and, you know, at Oklahoma state, our quarterback was Mason Rudolph and he always had a good time with the strength staff of, we would call it river chunk. We'd sprint right and we'd chunk it out of bounds. And he would always throw that, that mortar ball, that high hanging ball. And it, the clock doesn't stop until it hits the surface. So he would throw it into all the strength guys and have fun of which guy he could try to hit on the sideline from the strength staff. So again, it was one of those things at the end of a Thursday when you're going through and finishing up, but USC had to pull it to get out of the half. And Josh Henson was one of our offensive analysts after he was the OC at Missouri and now he's there at USC. So it was kind of funny to see that all come to light. But that's an end of half game situation. And you also got the safeties at the end of a game. Yeah, I do want to go back and touch on one thing with taking a safety, which is another thing that can, you, know, you can consider down here. I mean, that's a whole other conversation on the, the analytics behind that. But in taking the safety, I think you really need to coach up your punter on a couple of things. One, number one, secure that catch. If he has to, right, it's got to fumble and get it out of the back of the end zone right away. But after that catch, to take a little bit of the time off, you don't want to just tell him, hey, scramble, because now he's left to uh, his own devices there, and uh, you just never know. So the one thing we'd always teach is uh, you could go either direction, but you're not allowed to change the direction because when you think about it, you change direction, the ball's flipping around too. And now you're in a bad situation where you could, if that guy turns, someone's there, the ball's out. So we'd always teach him to put that ball as he's running direction. You know, he's got ball security, but that ball is to the, the end line. 
and never back into the end zone there. So worst case scenario, his momentum is going to take him out. If for some reason a guy got to him, that hit is going to take him out as well. So it's just something, a little thing, but an important thing. And you, you always want to coach those up. You and I were talking before, just coaching the things up. You don't want to have to learn from your mistakes. You want to think about all the things that can happen in these situations before they happen. A hundred percent. I think that's a great point of the less you can have those guys do. And, you know, not to bring it into a larger point, but if we were taking a safety in the open field, we would always have our offense on the field if it wasn't backed up and throw it from our center to the quarterback and then him turn around and throw it to our best receiver and trust that guy to drain the clock Mm -hmm. versus having the punter leaving from open space. Great point. Right. In a tight, confined, backed up, where you're taking a safety, yeah, you got your snapper, so you have the distance between the line of scrimmage, but we would literally be in a three running back set with the two edges, and we would take the ball and throw it to our best offensive player and have him with the ball in open space to go take a safety from depth. So not to get into that world, but I think it's an important thing of just ball security and handling in a critical moment. And then the last situation I mentioned here, it only applies to the NFL in high school football college rules don't allow for it but when you're backed up like this the other side uh, this could be before a half this could be towards the the end of the game considering the situations here the fair catch for a free kick and I have a whole episode on this I'll link that in the show notes but definitely want to hit some of the high points of things you need to consider for this situation I think it's great to go back into these details just as a refresher because Everyone hammers that, and and we did an episode on the situational masters earlier, but it is just interesting when you think of, man, I'm in a bye week. You know, everyone's got their bye week last week or this week and the next couple. How do I take a breath and and think situationally of how to chunk these things up, just like it is on your call sheet, right? Because what's great about being in the game on Saturday, you only have so many options at some point. The kids know what they know. You've repped it. They feel comfortable with it. Well, we got to go execute it, but did we really think through why those three or four plays are the best ones? And you can start to see some situations from other teams that have come to light in games. And it is refreshing of, are those the right four or five plays, depending on the hash, depending on the time on the clock, depending on the down and distance for our team and our skill set. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was good for me to think through as well. So a, a couple of the main things there, I do believe, and having been in some of these situations before, when you look at that situation and you're setting up for a fair catch, for one, I want to make sure when I'm punting, you, you're not getting that opportunity. So really don't want to punt the ball down the middle of the field. If I can, there's one that's rolling out of bounds, and we avoid that situation. But the other thing is, if it's in the air, I want to do everything I can to secure the fair catch. So in those situations, I'd suggest putting at least two back, potentially even three to make sure you can get to the ball because the ball can move anywhere along that line where you set it up for that free kick. So, you know, it's advantageous for you to go ahead and let them put the ball in the air and fair catch it, right? You don't want a situation where they directional kick it and you don't have somebody outside the hashes to catch it. So you want to ensure that. And then the other thing, once you do get it, is you're allowed to line up in kickoff formation with a ball on a kicking tee and kick a field goal. So uh, a couple things there. The worst thing you could do is go offsides. And there's no reason for your guys to get a a running start. You're not going that far downfield. And, you know, you should be in an area, too, where you're pretty sure that that ball is going through the uprights, right? So... Uh, thinking about those little things, coaching them up. We always did it on a Thursday, one time every Thursday. Uh, in my career in coaching high school, uh, the opportunity to use it came up one time and we decided against it. Uh, I've seen it on film, other teams using it, and it's it's been actually happened in the NFL you know, a handful of times over the last several seasons. So again, just coaching up the details there, thinking about all the aspects of this. That's what this is about. And as we mentioned and looked at some of the techniques here today, and we will continue with this for sure where we're going to walk you down the field looking at both sides of the ball as well as special teams and how the the techniques and scheme and strategy is showcased in these moments. Keith, what I, what I hope is if this doesn't hit somebody's brain right now in the flow of the season and too many things flying around in real time, 
hopefully this ep episode is really evergreen of something to revisit during the off season, right? You can click back through these things and, and you know, as you're doing your own studies, if it's not during your bye week during the off season of how to reevaluate and just make sure what you do is best for your team. So hopefully it adds some value. Absolutely. And uh, Steve, we'll be back again for next week in another situation as we continue down the field. Thanks for taking the time to prepare this and we will have the links to uh, your moments on Twitter where we have all of these curated as well. Excellent. Thanks, Keith.